Namaskaram. Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. I am with Professor M D Nalapat. It's been a while since he has graced our channel. Professor Nalapat, Namaskaram and welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nalapat, you have been a member of the India China America Institute for upwards of I think maybe 30 years and uh, you've had uh, you know you've had friends in all these three countries and and the shifting sands that is the relationship between these countries has you know been a bit of a mystery to many of us and if you look at the current administration Biden administration the impression i get is they are speaking with many voices although you might disagree with me on this and um, the reason i'm making that assumption or a conclusion is that there is some flip flops going on and i don't know what's going on in china i don't know what's going on in india except that india is really really reeling under the second wave of covid that has hit it it seems like uh, there are some struggles there but please unravel this for us because i would like to draw on the wisdom of your experience of having been on uh, on you know been in touch with all these three countries well sri uh, thank you for 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 reminding me that uh, dr jagdish sheth who is a good friend and a, a brilliant uh, analyst he put me on the advisory board of india china institute more than 3 decades ago you're quite right and i've been tracking these three countries because i do believe these are the three most consequential countries in the world and their interplay is going to be a very significant the most significant factor in global geopolitics well you know you and i have been discussing this matter for quite some time and uh, i think we are both agree that what is going on now is in effect a uh, a cold war 2.0 now people may not like to use that word people may like to use some other word because it, it reminds them too much of what happened uh, you know in the case of the soviet union nobody wants to relitigate the past or revisit history but it, and it's not it's a very different cold war i mean we are talking when we talk about cold war 2.0 we are basically putting a shorthand to describe a situation where two systems are in competition with each other uh, it is the uh, democratic system it is the uh, the the system of china i wouldn't call china a classic uh, communist system uh, it's very different from the soviet system for example but it is definitely a system completely antithetical to the values to the processes to the principles of uh, of democracy such as the us and india now what is why is this important general secretary xi jinping is after mao zedong the leader who i think has a very transformational view of the world you remember in mao zedong's period i mean uh, directly and through individuals like lin biao who later on fell out of failure uh, uh, fell out of uh, if i may say so favor uh, well he was talking in terms of the the villages of the world that is the poorer countries overcoming the cities of the world the richer countries and these villages would of course be led by china today china has become a city uh, the largest almost the largest city in the world and i think xi jinping uh, mao believed that the world would be transformed in such a way that the chinese communist party system would prevail over the system of the united states of america of course he was very shrewd he was very clever he he saw that china was weak at a point in time he reached out to the united states and under uh, richard nixon uh, in order to handicap the soviet union the united states uh, uh, agreed to that they reciprocated and frankly the united states has been the foundation on which the growth of china took place in fact you know very oddly united states japan and taiwan are the three biggest factors behind china's success and all three are now targets of china it's just ironic how the you know the the, the history keeps moving but 
Having said that, Mao was biding his time. Deng Xiaoping came. Essentially, Deng Xiaoping was a fervent communist, a Chinese communist. Uh, I mean, I regard that essentially as Han nationalism, the Han exceptionalism. The Chinese are an exceptional people. The Han are an exceptional people. And they have dominated the world in their, uh, in their mind for thousands of years. For a few hundred years, that may have not been the case. But now the natural order of things must come back and they must again dominate the world. Deng believed that, but Deng was a very subtle individual. So he, in a sense, was able to camouflage that particular ambition and, and you know, give a very benign presence to the world. Now, you and I know the panda is actually a very ferocious animal. Uh, you don't play with pandas uh, unless, you know, you want to take some great risks with your health. Certainly not pandas that, who are not, that are not familiar with you. But if you see a photograph of a panda, if you see a panda, it looks like the most friendly animal you can see. It looks like a teddy bear, you know? You feel like reaching out to the panda. Well, that's what Deng Xiaoping uh, did with China. Every country reached out to China. And what they did, they transferred their supply chain to China. They bought uh, goods from China. They, uh, you know, basically gave a red carpet to China to take away whatever technology was needed. Bill Clinton, who is still celebrated in the United States, frankly, in the Democratic Party. Well, Bill Clinton, for example, gave a red carpet to China to, to take, take technology while putting an iron curtain to prevent India from doing the same. Bill Clinton obviously, you know, did not understand the Chinese system or did not understand the congruence of the Indian system with the American system. Xi Jinping, in my view, is taking over from where, you know, um, even more than Mao and Deng. Mao was talking in terms of, of you know, of the villages surrounding the cities, uh, through Lin Biao, through himself, talking in terms of, of uh, you know, of countries rising against the former colonial powers, developed powers. And frankly, it had a very high resonance. And although Jawaharlal Nehru also tried to get on the same bandwagon, the reality is that the Chinese were frankly a little more successful than him in that particular attempt, unfortunately, or whatever. Well, look, Xi Jinping is, in a sense, Mao on steroids. He is not hiding the reality that of, uh, of what Mao wanted, what Deng wanted, and frankly, what every leader of China has wanted right from the uh, foundation of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, PRC, the People's Republic of China, in, uh, in 1949, which is to ensure that China becomes the dominant power in the world. He is now of the view that China has reached a stage where it can be more open about what it wants. And he is very refreshingly transparent about uh, what he wants. Now, one thing that he has been doing, he did this look, the point is, what is the Achilles heel? Achilles was a great warrior. Uh, Achilles was an indomitable warrior, but he had a flaw. He had a vulnerability. And that was what was called the Achilles heel. According to Xi, the Achilles heel in the United States is the US dollar. The US dollar is the global reserve currency of the world. The US dollar is the unit of account of the world. Now, both these functions enable the US dollar and the monetary and fiscal authorities in the United States to do what they have been doing for a very long time, which is burn the printing presses up by printing dollar after dollar after dollar after dollar. You know, I got I know in the Republican Party, for example, Everybody is talking about, my God, what is Biden doing? Biden was only doing what Donald Trump was doing in spades, frankly. It's a little bit of hypocrisy there, just as you see Republicans now going out and saying, oh, look, you know, to all their constituents, look at all the tax dollars that are flowing to your district. Look at all the tax dollars that are flowing to where my Senate seat is and claiming credit for it when every last one of them voted against it. Every dollar that has reached the pockets of the American citizen, 
I can tell you since Biden came to office, has come despite the Republicans and not because of them. Well, whether that is going to cost them the election or not, we do not know. But that's a fact. Xi Jinping believes that the dollar is weak and that the dollar can be made to enter a reset. He has been quietly working on multiple fronts. You and I have discussed this actually, I think, a very long time ago. And at that point in time, it was considered to be a little far out. I mean, these views are considered to be a little far out. Today, I mean, it's happened with me so often in the past. I say something, it's looked at far out, and then all after some time, it becomes mainstream. And that's what's happened now. The reality is he has been working, for example, on this digital currency. He recognizes correctly that digital currency is the wave of the future. He recognized, I think 2018, if I'm not mistaken, that it is futile to ban Bitcoin. You know, banning Bitcoin the way the Reserve Bank of India is trying to do is like King Canute telling the waves, go back. I'm King Canute, you better go back. Bitcoin is not going to go back. Let's be honest. It's, a, it's going to be a fact of life in the whole world. And we better get used to it. We better understand it. And we better take advantage of it. Well, so he is now, in a sense, preparing for a reset of the US dollar. And he's not only preparing for it, he's pushing that process forward by two or three things. So many people have talked about, my God, he's spending tens of billions of, of dollars on this Belt and Road system. Yes, tens of billions of dollars, not renminbi, not, uh, not rubles, but do not euro, but dollars. Why? He is previously, the Chinese used to buy vast amounts of US Treasury bills. Soon after Xi Jinping came to power, very, very quietly, they started changing their portfolio from treasury bills. They started using their dollars in expenditure on the Belt and Road Initiative. It's built up a, a huge amount of infrastructure for China. It's built up a certain amount of geopolitical backbone in Eurasia, which is now logistically controlled by China. It has done a lot of good, but, and it has also cost a lot of money. But that money would other, otherwise have been spent in buying U.S. Treasury bills. They're not doing that. Secondly, the petrodollar. Petrodollar is the fact that petroleum, which is such an important feedstock, is denominated in dollars, is a very important factor why the dollar is the universal the unit of account. And that's why the dollar becomes the reserve currency of the world, something which enables the Fed to basically use the printing presses 24-7 and buy more and more printing presses, use them also 24-7. Well, he's now, even Saudi Arabia, I'm told, he's working out arrangements that, you know, you, 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 we, we'll buy your oil, but don't sell it, but don't charge us dollars for it. We'll pay renminbi or something else. Now, I think that's happening quietly all over the world. So you have on the one hand, the treasury bills not being bought. You have on the second hand, on the other thing, that is, uh, petroleum and other goods are increasing to be traded away from dollars. Yes, Sri. Are they, are the Saudis going to buy the renminbi or the digital version of renminbi? You're go you know, let me tell you one thing clearly, Sri, that's a brilliant question. The reality is the digital version two or three years is going to be the version. And the Chinese are going to have the first mover advantage in that. Neither the United States nor India nor Britain, any of these countries, nor Germany, uh, nor Switzerland, any of these countries are anywhere near the sophistication of digital currency. And what is she doing? He's grounding it in blockchain. Uh, you're a tech expert. I'm not. You know, blockchain is, is pretty, uh, you know, reliable and it's pretty transparent. He is grounding the renminbi in that. And he has been used, by the way, from about 2013 onwards, he has been buying gold. The Chinese have been buying gold from central banks across the world, including from the United States. So he's building up a buffer of gold. He's building up a, 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 a digital currency. And he believes that they're going to have the credibility to basically replace the dollar when the expected dollar reset. I mean, my calculations of it suddenly sharply falls by about 20 percent. You're going to see a panic sell off of the dollar because people all over the world have got dollars. People all over the world have kept savings in dollars and whether, you know, here, there or whatever. 
this and then that is going to lead to a 30 to 40 or 50 60 degree uh, uh, fall in the value of the dollar and lo and behold this reset will become a reality so xi jinping is working hard for that putin is working hard for that the chinese have been a little more uh, less transparent if i may say so a little more subtle less transparent the russians you look at rt Rus russian television it's all about how the dollar is such a shaky currency the dollar is actually you know not i mean it, it's a, it's 130 years old it's on sticks it's on uh, it's on ventilator it's on you know it's on life support this knocking of the dollar in rt is very transparent and that is part of the fact that both russia and china are unitedly working to bring down the value of the dollar and reset the dollar now if you look at the amount of dollars that is sloshing about in the world outside of the united states a rough estimate is two thirds is outside of the united states than inside the united states i mean if she can convince people that my digital renminbi is backed by gold and here is all the gold and he shows his version of fort knox that would convince a lot of people to say well i will take it from you as long as they have some way of escrowing that gold to make sure that you know if in case there's a problem i can trade the renminbi for gold in future is there something like that also being planned look uh, the chinese have been buying gold in large numbers and my my suspicion is they already have much more gold than the united states has the united states is really not bothered to look after its gold hoard ever since uh, nixon for example took it off of uh, gold uh, yeah. peg yeah exactly yeah. 71 if i'm not mistaken uh, ever since that the chinese have been quietly buying gold since xi jinping xi jinping let me tell you look i am very un i think he's made one big mistake uh, and that is that he's had this relationship with pakistan and in the context he has really damaged relations with india i think that's a huge mistake i have been saying this for some time that pakistan is going to be for china what afghanistan was for the soviet union but xi jinping is an extremely smart guy the people around him and i met some of them they are extremely smart people and they are working to a plan and that plan is now transparently that china will first dominate the first of all the supply chains the logistical hubs everything across eurasia next the indo pacific then the atlantic he is working to a plan very very clearly the question is is america i mean let's talk in the sense of the president of the united states the prime minister of india the system in india the system in america are they working to a plan are they even aware that there's an existential threat poor anthony blinken is still going around you know mouthing kissinger's platitudes oh america and china should sit down and talk america and china should sit down and talk the chinese want that kind of conversation to be the same conversation that the americans had under khalilzad with the taliban the taliban pointed a gun at khalilzad's head and said you surrender i don't care what you say you can say it's a great victory i have not surrendered i've actually won when i've lost but you have to surrender now what essentially what they're looking at what kissinger is now advocating but he may not be aware of it is the chinese will be happy with an accommodation with the united states if it is on the same terms as the taliban which basically means a complete surrender to them well uh, i'm not sure so sure that us is going to surrender so quickly no I, i'm sure they won't i'm i'm not saying they will at all and in fact that is where i want to say that by joe biden is fighting back in my i am a strong supporter of this uh, of this trillion dollars uh, plus stimulus that joe biden is trying to shepherd through congress the chinese are absolutely convinced that what i call the dinos democrats in name only will sabotage biden they are very very nervous about biden succeeding in pushing that plan through the us congress if it is pushed through the us congress there's a very good chance democrats will capture the senate uh, in a stably and expand their hold on the house of representatives they do not want to see that so what is happening mitch mcconnell he's essentially playing i'm sorry to say to the chinese playbook by completely blocking any support for this plan the reality is so long as the dollar 
is the global reserve currency, Biden can afford this huge stimulus. But the day the dollar falls from that, well, the United States will not even be able to fund its police and its military. Now, question for you, um, Professor Nalapat. Why is this one trillion infrastructure plan making the Chinese nervous? Already, the United States has plowed in four trillion with an additional two to three trillion easily to come. This is a lot of money already. How, this is, how does this 1.8 trillion extra make them more nervous? I'll, I'll tell you for two reasons, she. One is, uh, you know, is, she is very nervous. And she is nervous because of, I mean, in my view, because of two reasons. One, the additional infrastructure will ramp up the productivity of the Americans. It will definitely improve the volume of manufacturing in the United States. It will improve the standard of life of people in the United States. And it will essentially be a stabilizing factor for the US system of governance. I don't think that is uh, music to the ears of either China or now Russia. I don't think so. Or any of the countries that are linked with them in this Cold War 2.0. That's, that's the first reason. The, the second reason is very, very simple. And the second reason is that uh, the China wants to remain, at, is linked to the first, the, the, the factory of the world. And if you have American infrastructure being improved, well, America becomes the, the factory of the world. Secondly, Biden has very correctly said, human infrastructure is as important as physical infrastructure. Internet infrastructure is as important as physical infrastructure. And this, and, the, and I think it's several trillion dollars, it's not just one. It's a, in my reckoning, it'll come to finally about four trillion dollars, finally. Well, if all this succeeds, then the United States is going to be as strong as it was when it confronted the Soviet Union in the era of Brezhnev. Today, that's not the case. Today, the United States is gasping for air where competing with China is concerned. And except for a few fields of activity, which the Chinese expect to catch up with in five to seven years, if not 15, the United States is clearly on the defensive. Whereas in the, as soon as, when, during the Brezhnev era, the United States could be on the offensive. If this infrastructure plan of Biden works, I can tell you, the United States will not be on the defensive it will be on the offensive. At the same time, what we are seeing across the world now, American citizens are beginning to understand what China is. Indian citizens are beginning to understand what China is. Frankly, Sri, I was very surprised when Prime Minister Modi agreed to withdraw from the Kailash Heights. I had said, I think on television, that this is never going to happen. Modi is never going to agree to a withdrawal. Well, he agreed to the withdrawal. Somebody told him that, oh, don't worry, the PLA is going to withdraw from the from locations where they are strong. Let's withdraw from the location that we are strong. Well, it's now about nearly a year and a half, I would say, almost uh, since that withdrawal took place. Where are the Chinese withdrawing? Not an inch. They are expanding their forces. They are, uh, they are beefing up their, uh, their, their capabilities. They are all over the, the frontier. This is exactly what I had predicted. But then, you know, I mean, the, you, have this, uh, you have this dream about China in the Lutian zone. You have the dream about China in the Washington Beltway. Henry Kissinger, and our, I mean, seems to be the epitome of that dream that, no, we can work out an arrangement. Yes, Henry, you can work out the same arrangement that uh, Khalil Zad worked out the Taliban, which is surrendered to a force out to destroy you. Well, um... You know, Professor Nalapat, one of the things that keeps coming up is China has not just tried to do global domination by uh, being the manufacturing house for the whole world. They've also had this problem to deal with. There is this virus, which many are not buying that it is something that happened from bats. People are saying, like, for example, I'll give you some data points, which is, you know, food for thought. A normal virus, such as a SARS virus, not, not the new one, but the previous one, or any other virus, is about 20 microns in diameter, and it has a shelf life. If you keep it outside, in two to three hours, it will die. 
sunlight falls on it, it just dies. The new one, the COVID-19, is about 10 times the diameter, 200 micron. And it is taking 72 hours for it to, you know, completely disintegrate. Initially, there was a fear that if you can, uh, you know, you can get it from touching surfaces. So everybody went and, you know, did all this cleaning solution. Now that has diminished somewhat. But the ability of this virus to come up and mutate with some very, very powerful form. I'll give you another example, Professor Nalapat. The initial version that came last year, if you picture the, 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 there is a ball and you had these proteins around it, right? Those proteins look like nails. Now, the 2.0, the one that has hit India, is not nail-like. It is more like a, a cloud, ma mushroom cloud-like thing. So, somewhere, somebody is able to flip something and then this thing has a slightly different signature. Now, call me a conspiracy theorist, but I am at a struggle to, I am at a loss to find out how can this be done so effortlessly when the neighboring countries don't seem to have it. Africa seems to have completely bypassed all this. And here is the thing, China practically owns all of Africa. So well, I'm, I'm, so why would he want to do both? Economically, you know, bring US to its knees, but also attack with a virus. Look, uh, I, I would like to point out, Sri, that I think, uh, I mean, I have, I have uh, written, I have said on this thing that there is a very credible hypothesis that the virus accidentally leaked from the Wuhan lab. And as you correctly said, it is uh, the, the main, the main uh, smoking gun in my mind was the fact that two things. One is the bats of Yunnan, 1,500 kilometers away from Wuhan, where the clusters first appear. Right. Uh, the second smoking gun is the fact that where is the intermediate vector? You know, you had bats, camels, and then human beings in the MERS virus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus. You had the uh, you had the bats, then you had uh, uh, civet cats, and then human beings in SARS-1. There is no intermediary uh, uh, host till today in SARS-2. Even the, even the Chinese masters of, uh, war, I mean, information, warfare or whatever, they have not been able to come up with a believable explanation of the intermediate vector. So you have a virus that is there in the bat and you have no vector, which essentially means that it is very likely this virus was created in the lab. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, everybody who has an interest in creating that virus should thank the United States of America and the Europeans. Oh, because of that funding. <laughs> part, part of that money came from the United States of America. And what did we find? A gentleman called Peter Daza, very close to Anthony Fauci, the grand guru of fighting the virus. Uh, Peter Daza used to write big checks to the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Peter Dazak knows several people who have collaborated with people in the Wuhan Institute of Virology to develop the same virus, not a different virus, the same virus. I mean, this uh, this thing has been going on, I mean, uh, since around, I would say, 2013 at least. This, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese have collaborated with the Americans, they have collaborated with the Europeans. That is why Dazak got a letter printed in Lancet very early on, I think. You know, I think February, if I'm not mistaken, of last year. Oh my God, those you know who are talking about this being a lab leak are conspiracy theorists. Immediately, some other chap, I think a guy called Ferguson, wrote in some uh, another letter. You know, a letter is a personal opinion. It's not, it doesn't need to be backed up by data. It's not an op-ed. It's a, it's just a personal view. I can write a letter that P Guru is the best channel in the world. Tomorrow I can write a second letter that this was the worst channel in the world. No one can hold me accountable. It's only a letter. It's only a reflection of my views. On these two letters, the entire world media went bananas and said, oh my God, it cannot be a lab leak. Whether it's CNN, whether it is BBC, whether it is, I mean, you know, you, uh, India. Look, the in India, the authorities are completely reliant on the WHO. WHO is the purveyor of holy scripture where the Indian authorities are concerned. They have gone entirely by the WHO rulebook. 
and the who in my opinion is most responsible for this particular pandemic but if you want to trust the person who set the fire to put out the fire well i am not able to say anything because i can't understand the workings of government at all i had never been in government and i can't understand its working but i'd like to say that there's a very credible thing and the second point is even this new strain that you're talking about well the reality of situation is the old strain could have been reengineered it is the mutation into such a change of mutation has happened over such a period of time and it's conveniently been labeled the indian variant well all over the world now you know we, we may call it by a complicated name but everybody's oh the indian 1. variant 1.617 yeah exactly and uh, and the reality of situation is that indians now you know i i'm told in in in, a, in in some parts of the world like hong kong and singapore when you see when somebody looks like an indian hails a cab the cab driver sh- accelerates and shoots off or just puts down the thing and says i'm not available he 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 or she is terrified of having an indian passenger that's what's happening now so look uh, but uh, i mean uh, i'm not saying anything because i don't want to be you know uh, I, I, you know sri people who don't like the fact that we are give we give a second opinion we give a different point of view we have been called conspiracy theorists many 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 times over and when these conspiracies become real and the people who call us those theorists embrace those theories they forget about the abuse that they hurled on us and they in fact some of us have had the i mean have had the good fortune of listening to them explain one's own theory to you and say you know this is the situation this is what i have discovered quote and quote the same guy who calls me a conspiracy theorist five or six months later five or six years later tells me oh you know uh, uh, professor this is what i have discovered i say wonderful you're a remarkable chap really it shows the amazing intellect that you have that's all i can say so yes let me tell you the chinese concept of war is all out war it's not guns and bullets only as in the case of the west it's a war involving bio it's a war involving industry it's a war involving human minds and i'd like to say in the in the uh, in social media you see the fringes expanding at the expense of the core in the united states in britain in uh, in india in germany in uh, east, uh, you know in the european union the right fringe is expanding the left fringe is expanding the center is getting squashed i have written in the sunday guardian uh, uh, on this quite a long time ago that i am very clear that there is a calculated disinformation campaign to ensure that the fringes grow and hit the middle and they both attack each other but more importantly they attack the middle don't forget sri in you know in germany in the 19 in the 19 late 1920s the nazi party and the communists collaborated against the social democrats you had the communist party of of Deutsch, the kpd you know communist party deutschland and the uh, nsdap national social democratic workers party collaborating in many places to go after the the social democrats now this is what we are seeing here the right and the left are both compressing the middle and they are both focusing on the middle rather on each other and this is what is in my view part of it is internal a lot of it is external and neither in india nor in the united states have the security people woken up to that external factor in the fact that hate is now multiplying in these societies hate is now multiplying within the european union all kinds of social fissures are taking place nobody is taking this seriously because it's only a conspiracy theory quote on quote well um we have to wait and see how uh, this plays out but in my mind uh, both you and i professor nanapat uh, we are centrists we like to say it like we Absolutely. see it and and you know there are viewers are our viewers know who are the bright lights in the room and who are the tube lights in the room if the tube lights turns on and then tells the bright light by the way now i am up and this is what i found so be it i think people have to make their own conclusions on this but professor nanapat this was a, a great conversation 
I hope that uh, some of our conspiracy theories <laughs> come true sooner than the usual five to six month period because now time is actually running in, in a little bit faster. That's how I feel because every day comes with something new, something more drastic. But at, let's let's hope and pray that saner sense will provide, prevail and that uh, the world will stop and take a look at what is going on. Thank you very much. Namaskar.